How often have you been startled awake or mystified by a dream that you had the night before? And you go about your day trying to leave it behind you, but it just follows you around. Maybe that dream has something to tell you, but you don't know how to get the gifts it's trying to give you. Please stick around to the end of this episode. We discuss several different ways you can engage those dreams and try to figure out what they might be asking of you. And be sure to subscribe, like, and share the episode if you enjoyed it. And we're so glad you're here. Hey folks, welcome back to Get Centered, where the clinicians and practitioners from the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences come together and talk about topics that we love. Uh, Some are easy and some are difficult to talk about. This one is is pretty exciting, actually. Today we're going to talk about dreams. Rodney's going to lead the conversation, and before we start, be sure to hit the, uh, the like, if you like it, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. You're going to see a little bell out to the side. If you don't know what that means, it's notifications. So whenever we release a new episode, you'll be notified about it. And that way you can be exposed to the content as, uh, as it's released real time. So thanks for being here. Thank you all for being here. And Rodney, take it away, man. All right. Dreams. So how often uh, have we all said to someone, I had a weird dream last night or just mentioned it. And for so many people, their investigation sort of stops there. Uh, And some people would like to get more into it, uh, understand more about themselves, whatever's going on in their dream life, but don't necessarily have the tools to do that. Uh, You know, not everybody is working with uh, a psychoanalyst or a psychotherapist who's really attuned to to dream work. And many people are working with therapists who that's not uh, particularly a focus. So uh, I wanted to put together some basic tools uh, some basic instruction of, of working with our own dreams, our own dream images, and just start the conversation around that. First of all, uh, this happens so many times with clients who say, you know, I very rarely really remember my own dreams. Um, but once they start paying attention to them, they start coming. So our relationship with our dream life is like with a new friend. It's like when you pay attention to someone, which means being open and listening to them often they respond back and we get to know them better. And our dream life can often be the same way. Uh, Sometimes for me, in a lot of years of recording my own dreams, what I've discovered is the easiest thing is a voice memo. Because often it's like, oh, I'll remember that later. And no, we don't remember it later. Uh, So there's sometimes we can write down or we can, you know, do a memo on our phone. But what I find the easiest thing is just to record a voice memo, no matter how confusing, and then go back later and see how much we remember. And, uh, and keep track of it that way. I think another reason that people sort of get lost in the weeds with, uh, with dreams, they say, you know, I had a really weird dream and it doesn't make any sense. Um, one way that I like to think of the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious is that between civilization and nature. You know, we have civilization, we have societies and cities and malls and things like that. Um, And those function along very different rules as nature, going out into nature. So, you know, a swimming pool is not the same as the ocean. And going to a mall is not the same thing as going out hiking in the wilderness. And if you use the rules for one to apply to the other, it doesn't work. So to go hiking in the wilderness and be disappointed because you didn't run into a Starbucks means, you know, you're not looking for the right thing. And so when we apply the rules of our sort of conscious linear, more literal, everyday life to the dream life. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. But that's, again, like saying, well, I was hiking and there was nowhere to buy a Starbucks. So uh, to give us a few ways of thinking about our dream images and the way that things come up that make more sense to the dream life itself. And so uh, when Jungians talk about dream interpretation, we talk about different levels of interpretation, say, an image or a person comes up, there are many ways to think about that different image. And I would like to to put those into into four different categories. First, we would call subjective, which is say, does this person represent an inner part of myself? This person remind me of a part of myself that my dream life is wanting me to reflect on or get to know better. Um, Objective is the external world. You know, maybe it's someone that you actually do. Is it about my relationship with that person actually in the objective world, um, in outer uh, reality, as it were? 
Then a lot of unions don't necessarily emphasize this, but I think the cultural level is very important as well. I think we have a lot of influences by our culture, what's happening in politics, what's happening in the world around us, what's happening in our culture and our responses to that. And often those can seep into our dreams. Um, and it isn't necessarily just a part of, of our own individual biography, but it's also something that we're responding to in the culture. And then there's the archetypal. And when Jungians talk about the archetypal level, we're really talking about how images and symbols show up for all of humanity. So how, you know, is an image or symbol that is showing up in my dream also related to mythology and religion and is something that humans have been experiencing for thousands of years. So uh, to sort of walk through a very specific example of these levels, say we dream about somebody from seventh grade. It's like, okay, and this happens to all of us. It's like some random person pops up. It's like that was somebody in the seventh grade. I haven't thought of them in years and years. Why on earth would that you know, person pop up now? And generally we just say, well, that was weird. And we just sort of go on with it. Um, so to talk through those four levels, I, I'd like to give us like two scenarios. So say in the first scenario, it was someone who was a bully or someone who really we did not like and made us very uncomfortable and picked on us. Second scenario is someone we had a crush on, but never, maybe never talked about it or it didn't go anywhere. So now to go through the four levels. On a subjective level, if we're dreaming of a bully, how am I bullying myself? What are ways that I am taking aspects of myself and uh, shoving them around and not paying attention to them and not letting them be heard? It, say it's, you know, what, whatever. I, I really want to do something or I want to spend time doing this or pursuing a hobby or reading this kind of thing, but no, you know, I have to, uh, I have to act in a certain way or I have to act more what, you know, I, I think the people around me want to do. And that's a kind of inner bully. If it's a crush, um, say, yeah, what inside of me is something that I'm kind of attracted to and want to pursue, but I'm afraid to speak up about it. You know, what, what are things that I would like to uh, integrate, to, be, to have a relationship with, but I'm not necessarily taking the steps for that to happen. But that's all on an inner psychological level. So we'd say the subjective level. The beauty about dream interpretation is also that things can be on all of these levels simultaneously. We don't have to pick one or the other. It's just, it's for reflection. And another thing, I think a misconception is that when we go to dreams for answers, that can be very misleading. I, misguiding. I think we go to dreams for questions. Dreams ask us the right questions. And that's why they're interesting. And that's why skeptics would say, was it telling me this or is it telling me that? It's like, no, maybe it's just asking you something. And then you, it's up to you to work out what the true meaning of that is. And I think that's more empowering than giving the dream some sort of power. It's like, I need to work that out. It's like, no, it's gonna ask me questions. And then it's up to me and my consciousness to work it out. Continuing with our crush slash bully. Um, so if we go to the objective level, um, if it's a bully, maybe it's the workplace. What is happening in my objective outside world, my relationships, you know, marriage, friendships, whatever, where I do feel bullied? Is there something that I'm not really paying attention to or not willing to come to terms with that this dream is saying, no, this is an outer situation that is reminding you of what it felt like to be bullied in the seventh grade. And now you're not in the seventh grade anymore and you can deal with it in a very different way. You know, or if it's a crush, the opposite. Is there something that I'm really wanting to get involved with, you know, as an adult that I'm wanting to engage with? So why am I afraid to do that? You know, why was I afraid to talk to my crush in the seventh grade? And is it triggering a similar, similar kind of fear response with someone I would like to engage with or, or an idea I would like to do or something I would like to pursue professionally? Then we get to a cultural level. And I think this can't be underestimated. You know, how are cultural forces, how am I being pushed around? Um, and how do I feel marginalized in a cultural way? Um, you know, and to, to really take into consideration, or again, with the, with the crush, what is there something culturally that I would like to pursue or, or would like to get involved in? Or cultural ideas that I feel like are, are too grandiose for me, whether it's, you know, taking a, an adult education class or, or something else, something that I would like to pursue in the real world culturally that I might be afraid to do. 
And then archetypally, I mean, you know, throughout human history, there have been those who have been marginalized. I mean, uh, so many of, of, of our religions, you know, speaking from a, a, a Christian background, you know, certainly Christianity is based on the idea of the outcast, the bullied, the marginalized. So how has that been a, a theme for all of humanity? How is that showing up in my life? And how is that something that can bring us to, to connect to others, to connect to, to the way that people have dealt with these themes in a personal and in a collective way throughout human history, you know, or, or, or the crush, how um, so often in mystical language, mystical language of, of connecting to the divine is often spoken of in very sexualized terms, that the, the idea of connecting to something um, in a romantic way um, is, is a wonderful metaphor for uh, what it means to connect to the divine. And so looking at these things symbolically, th this rather than just kicking off a conversation, this sort of turned into a mini lecture. But, uh, but, but I think there are so many ways that with just a few tools, if we start digging into our own dream life, uh, then you can, we, we can find resonance with that. And, you know, I know everyone on this particular call has, has done a lot of dream work and, and work in that area. And so in a way, this is a bit of, of preaching to the choir in terms of getting people interested in dream work, you know, but maybe to open up the conversation a little bit, you know, wherever we would all like to go, but also how has reflection upon dreams really translated into deeper understanding of yourself or of your environment or of your relationships? Okay, this is fun. Thanks, Rodney. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, speaking of the cultural piece, there are certain cultural um, limitations that we have to our understanding of subjectivity in the first place. Uh, meaning the the kind of attention that we actually the, uh, the the attention or the value that we put on to our inner worlds is is arguably pretty minimal uh, from a collective standard uh, from a collective stance so I, I think in you know I, I I was thinking about uh, I think about this a lot but um, there's a term qualia in the philosophy world which is the the kind of mysterious subjective experience of uh, the typical thing is the color red or the taste of you know marinara sauce you know your there's no way for me to know that my red is your red and and what happens is that that our our the science uh you know uh, uh, what we do to understand our world is we try to make it verifiable uh replicable um measurable and, and so, and there's nothing that can be replicated in my experience of red. Um, you know, the, we, we, we are the, the, there's, there's so many different theories of consciousness that like, you know, a network of neurons comes together and then all of a sudden the lights are on and we have John or Rodney or Leela Scott or Ariel or whomever. And, and this is a very confusing space for philosophers and scientists because we have no way to measure or replicate or understand uh, the, the qualia, our subjective experience. And this is what is so important about dreams is it's totally 100% your own. <laughs> there is, there is, it is absolutely independent of the, the world. I, I can't get access to your dreams. Your words that you use to describe your dreams can't get access to the experience of the dream. So I think the first thing that stands out to me is that paying, I like where you started with a friend, Sean Fitzpatrick, one of uh, all of our friends. Um, he mentioned to me when I was looking at dreams, he said, dreams are like a lover. The more you attend to it, it attends to you. And so it's this relationship with one's inner experience and how, how we position our own subjective experience in our lives and how we value that. But we certainly put a value on our social life, on our interpersonal relationships, on our capacities to make money and engage in the outer world uh, but we just don't do us uh, we don't have the symbolic life that um, more ancient traditions did so the first thing i think of when i think of dreams is that it's it is it is totally private it is uniquely this sounds weird to say but it's uniquely mine and it, it's pretty ineffable you know because there is the emotional dynamic there's the imagistic aspect there's the experiential aspect so that positions it into this kind of mystical realm of ineffable. 
you know, it can't be spoken into words. There's some kind of download that happens. There's an experience that you have where some knowledge or some insight or some curiosity, something is, is, is uh, sub submitted or transmitted to your conscious mind. Um, and and there, there we start making these um, of William James's four uh, categories of mystical events. That's two of them. So every night we go to bed, we have this powerfully uh, uh, miraculous experience um, that religions have very much mined for many, many centuries, but to current day, we just don't get into it as much. So <clears throat> I think the first thing um, is that we can, we can animate our lives in a fantastic way, not by uh, deriving anything, not by getting anything, <coughs> not by, <coughs> excuse me, earning anything, but just by relating to something like our dreams and things tend to shift. I think that's that first and foremost, that's very powerful. Um, and it's contrary to the way that we kind of live our lives in, uh, in the world today. That was a lot too. It's hard for it not to be a lot. This is such a massive topic. And it's, I think for people like us who can't get enough of it and there are so many different layers and ways to approach it and understand it I'm even kind of reeling with where do I begin? I mean, you know, obviously for somebody to engage their dreams, there has to be a comfort and a willingness to go into the world of symbols and to exit at least for a period of time rationale because at, as we're saying, dreams are exaggerative and symbolic and not often if not always are not literal. You know, and while they are, my own and your own there there's this probing that we can do as innocuously as possible in an effort to not overlay our own projection and meaning onto somebody else's dream but there is a process that we can engage whether it's with an analyst or a dream group or your own journal dominant non-dominant hand journaling where you can inquire of the dream so if, if so I agree that dreams often are posing questions as opposed to answers. But I also believe that answers can be found in those questions. You know, um, there's an example. This is not a dream that was brought into, into my clinic experience, but one where a, a woman dreamt of she was having a terrible health condition and she was actually working with a Chinese medicine practitioner and they were working a dream together and this dream she ended up at a witch doctor so like a barely clad witch doctor bone through the nose and everything and at first it's like what in the world does what does this witch doctor have to tell me but when they worked it what they realized is that she was wondering which doctor which type of doctor it can help me and this the the images were all around the dream that this barely clothed you know indigenous looking person who was not in a clinical office with a white coat and you know chrome and aluminum everywhere she needed to go to earth medicine so that was actually what the dream was telling her you know so um the other piece that I wanted to be sure and bring in is that if we are holistic practitioners, which we try to be, we cannot rule out what happens over the course of one third of our lives. We sleep at least a third of our lives and that world that we enter when we go to sleep is rich. So to just tune it out as if it's just wasted, um, wasted thoughts or, oh, I'm just figuring out, you know, putting things in filing cabinets that, that came across my path yesterday, you know. And then also what you said, Rodney, about that seventh grade example, I think it's interesting to consider if a dream happens in the past that maybe we're, we're being asked to go back and try to engage whatever, who we were at that time or what might have happened like maybe there was a trauma that year or a real realization about who you are as a person you know so sometimes i think those odd characters that show up from the past 
are just a pathway to reintroduce ourselves to a time in our lives that we need to go back and, and mine a little bit. So I have a million more things, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. I'm like, just, I'm still just trying to get my footing here. Cause I, I'm, I think I'm probably the newest of the group to the dream work world. Um, I've been doing some work with Rodney. So uh, for, for a while now, and what I think has been interesting for me on my own uh, pathway is how much I'm, uh, I'm how much resistance I have to doing the work in the first place. I mean, I think that's one big piece of it is that I, I will wake up from, first of all, I have a very active dream life. So I'm, I'm dreaming every night, like constantly throughout the night. So when I wake up in the morning to try to recall all of what happened in my dreams, I might be sitting there with a vo voice note for an hour, you know? Um, so, th so that's number one. Number two is I also feel a resistance, like I, good riddance like I'm done with the dream <laughs> like sometimes I wake up from a dream and it's not like it's not pleasant I, w I wake up sometimes and the the emotion that comes out of that situation is actually not something I'm trying to I'm trying to move I'm trying to take a breath and move on not and leave it there <laughs> so I do find myself also resisting even uh even logging it in the first place because I'm kind of like, okay, well, I want to I be done with that. I'm not, I don't want to dwell on that. Let's keep moving. I'm awake now, finally. Maybe you have something to say about that kind of resistance level. but I'm, I'm just curious if it's about every type of dream or only the unpleasant dreams. Um, the, there's so many unpleasant dreams. <laughs> yeah. I, I just am feeling compelled to say much like in our waking life when we're avoiding handling something or confronting something, it just keeps looping back because it's like, mm, you're not gonna get away with this way. <laughs> we can have to confront this. I have a feeling that could be happening in your dream. Oh, it's happening. Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely happening. Yeah, and we're getting there. We're sort of like circling back, but it, it does, I am committed to the process, so I'm doing it. It's just like, um, it's interesting that it's not, it's not like, um, it's not for me been um, binary. It's not like I wasn't tracking my dreams and now I am fully tracking my dreams. It's like, no, I was not. And now I'm sort of uh, incrementally starting to build the practice, which it's a practice, right? It's a discipline. Even to log the dreams is its own allotment of time and prioritization of that's what I'm going to do first thing in the morning as opposed to all the other things I could do first thing in the morning. So it's a kind of uh, it's kind of a shift. You gotta get in that mental space to even do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, bad information also about dreams, and it seems pretty scary to people. I told I told a woman once years ago that I was meditating, and she looked at me like I was growing horns out of my head, and I was part of the like demonic cult or something. The idea of turning inward is scary to people. I think. And there's a lot of religious um, uh, there's a lot of uh, religious dogma that supports that belief system that that we need to not look within. Which is just ironic, considering so much of the ancient texts, totally. including the Bible, show messages coming through dreams. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, our, uh, religion today really our, our understand. I think culturally, when we talk about religion, we're only really talking about a religious worldview that's about 30 to 50 years old. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have the same kind of philosophical and metaphysical worldview that people did even 150 years ago. And to use the, the analogy that I did before, I think religion is more like nature and we've turned it into the mall. You know, we, we've tried to make it controllable and accessible. Right, when there's, when there's a wildness and uncontainedness to our dreams, I mean, lots, my dreams are the, like I, I've had these reoccurring dreams of these powerful events in nature, tidal waves and really big experiences that are so meaningful. And they, the, the, the thing I wanted to say about qualia, Rodney, just to link up to what you were saying earlier is that for me, on some level, the dream imagery continues to work on me. like like memories from a really cool vacation do. 
You know, like I go someplace and I revisit or I'm just sitting and I laugh out loud about something that happened three years ago. And it's like that it leaves a residue and I, I can access maybe about if I think I'm at five to 10 dreams, pretty like tangibly, like these are, these are lifelong uh, dreams that I've had that leave a mark. And so they, it's not some kind of like, boom, there's insight that happens. It's like, it, it like a relationship, it works on you, you know? And, and I do, I think also the important piece is to differentiate between the conscious and unconscious. And I, I think that, I can't remember if it was you or, um, Ronnie, you or Leela Scott, um, that our conscious mind can project what we consciously think and feel onto our dream imagery. And so on some level, we have to get that thing out of the way and say, what, you know, why is this happening? You know, what is going on? You know, what is the symbolic nature of my dream? And then, and, and neuroscience is coming around to this, we're talking about many different forms of consciousness. There are, Anil Seth talks about consciousnesses of, of the, that we, that are with us. And so each of those have some degree of autonomy. And look, I want to get up in the morning. I want to, you know, get up on time. I want to make my appointments. I want to be able to remember how to cook food and do the steps and be organized and all that. That's like ego, uh, but that's only a part of us. And when we go to sleep, that thing is out. And so we are, I mean, we're, we're a little psychotic when we sleep. You know, that's, that's a or, or completely or, or totally. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we have this, this, um, we're awash with these wild and sometimes exciting and, and challenging and sexual and intense and like, or mundane. And like, I knew a person once who dreams words that she's never heard before and she'll have to look them up uh, and they are an actual word. It's like ancient Aramaic or something that like, and, and then where does that send you? Like, where the hell did that come from? Do you accept the challenge or the call to engage that and discover what's, what's being kicked up in the quote unconscious? So I, to, to pay attention to dreams is to put yourself into a kind of, um, a, you know, cosmological or metaphysical space that is not very practical. <laughs> Um, and it's certainly not very popular from, um, it, it is from our whole entire cultural heritage, but not from the recent human history. And for me, that, that, that's what you're speaking about in terms of like um, the subjective nature of the mind, of our experience, of like trying to uh, use an objective lens to paint onto the dream. For me, that's why it's been like, I, I, it's been uh, irreplaceable and, and sort of really, really important to the process to have somebody alongside me who is keeping those pieces in mind, even if I might know them for myself and I, you know, my, I don't, but I might. <laughs> and I, just to apply them to myself, it would be really hard. Um, whereas, you know, when I'm working with Rodney, he, he's in his own space. He's observing from the outside. He's asking questions. Because he really doesn't know, <laughs> you know, uh, for he he wants to know what's going on there actually, and and when he he's asking those questions, to clarify that actually forces my own reinvestigation, and then on on another level it's that archetypal, where he, I don't even know those archetypes, you know, I don't I don't have that depth of knowledge of all those various. Um, uh, themes, cultural and historic themes. So when he comes, he comes in. He's like, "Oh yeah, well Saturn is, you know, obviously this this one, you know, this symbol or whatever." And and I don't, you know, I'd never even heard of it before. So for me, that's a really cool element to start to play with, and and then wonder, oh, I I thought about it as just a car, but let's think about it from the archetypal side of things, and actually that does make a whole lot more sense. And also kind of can dredge up or not dredge up, but kind of like reveal um, all of a sudden a subliminal thing that I, I have been playing around with. I have been wondering about, but I haven't really had the words to put around that or concept or felt like safe in my ego, like consciousness to deal with. So I, it makes sense why it comes up in the dream context. And that's one reason I, I frame it as, as something that's presenting questions, because people who are more skeptical 
about dream work feel like what I'm supposed to remember my dreams and they're telling me what I'm supposed to believe or what I'm supposed to do. It's like, no, it's asking you questions and then peel back the layers and see what happens from there. And you'll know when you feel something, anyone who has had an experience like John was talking about um, with a powerful dream, it's, it is experiential. It's not about, oh, I read this thing about Saturn in Wikipedia, or, you know, it's not about some kind of knowledge. There's something that it involves the body and it involves a whole set of, of emotions. And that I, I think essentially is what the dream is getting at as a compensation and as a counterbalance to our much too heady, you know, again, like civilization being disconnected from nature. When we disconnect from nature, that's scary. When we think that we can actually, we're more powerful than nature and we can disconnect from it and we don't need it, you know, well, when there's no oxygen, well, we can talk about that, how dependent we are upon, upon nature. And I, and I think, you know, to, to John's point, th th there's a kind of disconnection because we feel so isolated from nature. We can be in our modern world, but anyone, I mean, we live in Houston, anyone who's lived through uh, a really scary hurricane or a natural disaster, something like that, knows the, the, the power of that world and our helplessness in that world. And I think, Ariel, one thing that you're talking to is sometimes dreams can bring up our feeling of helplessness, which is very frightening, but clearly it's bringing up something that we need to consider in a more, uh, in a more thoughtful way and see, well, you know, what is being asked of me in, in relationship to these really, really frightening forces? Yeah, our, the dream is not the problem. Our worldview is the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 we got to finish in a minute, but I propose something. I, I think that, Lila Scott, there is a lot here. <laughs> and I know that we were talking about doing a second episode, get a little, but I, I think we need to do more than that. But I, I, I think that for those of you watching, I think we need to have a conversation about kind of the practical applications of dreams and dream work. Um, so we can maybe start next time and talk about, to kind of continue the conversation about the deeper aspects, talk about practical aspects, but then we also want to talk about dreams as far as, you know, what does that bring up for New Year's and aspirations and when we more colloquially, colloquially, when we use the more colloquial term dream or the more colloquial use of it, we're talking about like what I want to have happen in six months or 10 months, you know, not it's certainly what we imagine about our future, but not like our dreams that speak to us in the, you know, when we're consciously uh, not as present as we are in our waking life. So there's a lot to this. Uh, how do y'all feel about that? that? That sounds great. I, I and mean, just throw one, one thought in at the end. I mean, uh, neuroscience has a lot of different ideas and opinions and disagrees a lot about, about dreams. But I think one thing that is a consensus is that dreams require quite a bit of, of brain energy mm -hmm. as we're sleeping. And if it weren't somehow, for whatever reason, a necessary part of what it means to be a human being, uh, it, wouldn't be some, it would be something that evolution had probably sort of weaned out as an unnecessary use of energy. So clearly it is something important to the human experience. And dogs too. Yeah, yeah. Tons of reasons on that. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> Um, well, let's, let's do that. Let's finish today and then we'll pick up next time. Um, and is there anything else in closing that you guys have just for today? I'm just trying to think of like, if somebody watches this and they're curious, like what's just a little, little something to, to let them play with this for themselves. I mean, we've talked about capturing the dream over voice memo or journaling, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think one piece that kind of keeps coming back to me to mention, it's just a little mention, but just noting the feeling tone of your dream. So for example, I might have a dream about spiders that is terrifying, but somebody else could dream about spiders and that's beautiful because they have a different relationship to spiders. So noting that the feeling tone of the dream in addition to whatever actually shows itself is they're equally important. What do you say, Rodney, practically speaking? Yeah, I mean, absolutely there. I think the most important thing is replacing judgment with curiosity. Yeah. And that, you know, because we, we judge a lot of things in our dreams, especially if they're of a sexual nature or something frightening, oh, we automatically have a judgment. But if we can investigate with curiosity, again, and go to the question, what, 
what could this possibly be raising for me? What could it mean? Um, then we can start peeling back the layers and it can take us on tangents that are incredibly meaningful. Yeah. So, so just have curiosity. And also we'll, the, the, the center will, I'm writing a blog for the center that will be online and I'll list some of these things, the different levels and, and some sort of practical ways of, of working with our own dreams. Yeah, I, I just want to challenge anybody, us too, but certainly those of you watching, I want to challenge you to write down a dream. Just start there. Just write it down. From you know, I, I don't think we're putting out an episode for another two weeks. You know, so take some time, um, write one down, and let it write one down for the in, with the intention of letting it work on you. Which sounds weird, you know, but we're constantly. I mean. My hunger works on me, you know, it sends a message to me emotionally, like, hey, man, you know, you need to eat. So our, our, do these different consciousnesses have intentions, they have autonomy, they have desires, they have, you know, things they dislike. And then we get conflict because, you know, I want to go do that thing, but I also need to eat first. And now I'm in two separate places. And that happens in our, in our nighttime. So let it work on you. So that's just, I think, basic you know, just write down a dream. And then we'll get into practicalities next time. It could be fun to, to workshop a dream. Maybe it's not the next hmm. time we talk about this. Maybe we need more context first, but I think it'd be really neat to do that. Cool. Cool. I'm down. All right, guys, anything else? All right. Thanks so for being here. So <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, be sure to like all the stuff and look down in the resource page. We'll include all kinds of links. And of course, a link to Rodney's blog will be up too. Check the website at thecenter4has.com. And, uh, and we'll be back next time. Thanks for joining us and see you then. Bye.